My name is Armin Garbagin. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the CEO of a startup uh, in Los Angeles called Shadecraft. It's a robotic startup uh, that creates a uh, product actually for the consumer. And our mission is to improve human life outdoors. And this presentation is a little bit different, I guess, than what you guys have been seeing in the last couple of days because I certainly am not an expert in IoT. Uh, I'm far from that, and I myself probably have more questions than uh, you know, many of you here. Uh, even though we are a robotic company full of engineers working on software, hardware, um, I find myself asking questions all the time. And I think one of the most important things that uh, you know, I wanted to do this uh, particular uh, uh, year was to have a few speaking engagements with groups such as yourself uh, that could possibly influence the outcome of what is happening in IoT. I think that's more of an important discourse for myself as a CEO of a company that is creating product for the consumer, um, who finds himself confused sometimes, and I'm sure some of you feel that way, uh, as you see products that are frivolously created on a daily basis. Um, and so this presentation is a little bit more from my own perspective uh, as a design uh, instructor, industrial designer. Uh, that is engineering uh, product uh, for the consumer. So I'm just going to go through some slides and I'd like you guys to engage because some of it's going to look a little bit different than the stuff you've seen. It's less informational and I'm more interested in creating a you know, quick discourse hopefully before we get to the cocktails uh, so that I can also learn some things uh, from the wonderful group that is amassed here in the last couple of days. Um, you guys have heard some amazing stuff uh, and I'm not really going to show you anything that's prophetic or have any information because if I believe that if it's information, it shouldn't be a part of a conversation like this or a presentation because my children, for example, when they were eight years old, uh, I used to ask him, okay, uh, Theo, do you want to hear about this? And he said, yes, and now today he's 14. And if I ask him if he wants to hear something, he says, oh, Dad, I can read all about it. Uh, I already know that. So... And I don't want to repeat what you can actually hear. It feels like when I go in and out, the sound changes. But uh, I don't want to repeat uh, the same things that you guys can find out for yourselves. Uh, so this would be a little bit more about my own personal viewpoint. And before I even go through the slides, I want to basically say my apologies if I offend anybody who has some great passion towards certain products that I'm going to show uh, that I personally don't have a passion for. Um, and it's important for us to know uh, what a community uh, that is uh, basically dealing with issues of IoT uh, is looking at the products that are being created on a daily basis. Uh, is the audio going in and out? Maybe I should switch the mic up a little bit. Okay. So sustainable solutions. Uh, Primarily, so this again is from the product design standpoint and the products that we see around us. So this is a perspective of, of an industrial design approach in a robotics company. Um, energy obviously is very important and, and we've used that uh, in bi biomimicry uh, to create solar energy. You guys know that. Form is also extremely important to nature and why it's important, why it's sustainable is not just because uh, of, of beautiful things, but it makes sense. And if it makes sense, the form is pure, and it's sustainable by default. Uh, context is also very important, something nature does, which I think a lot of startups, a lot of entrepreneurs should look at before they actually entertain trying to create a product and just put it out there for an exit in three years. And what's happening is what you see in IoT, which is basically my viewpoint. Although it's the most incredible thing, and we're living in this golden age, at the same time, we get hit with a zillion products out there that make no sense. Um, nature doesn't create frivolous commodities. It, it looks at the best solution and finds the easiest way, most efficient way. The honeycomb, for example, is, a, is an incredible uh, lesson in design. Obviously, you guys have seen some beautiful products in solar energy, some of which are uh, really beautifully designed, inspired by nature. Uh, you know, so you guys have been kind of dealing with the data side and where I, IoT is going, and I think that from a context standpoint, in terms of healthcare and much greater things, IoT is the most incredible uh, opportunity. But when it gets down into the human interface level, 
and when it deals with frivolous products such as socks and toothbrushes that are all connected to each other, it starts breaking apart for us. That's what I'm trying to hopefully uh, gain by understanding how you guys can impact the new startups, the new entrepreneurs, the new generation that is actually graduating and a 20-year-old that has an idea to create the next ridiculous object that is connected to five other things in the house that just creates confusion. I'm wondering if we really need that today. And that's basically where the, where the, uh, uh, the conversation is circled around. So structure, obviously, we've seen some beautiful things. And, you know, IoT is brought about today because of technology. And the same technology that created the IoT is allowing people to produce product frivolously, quickly, and put four sensors that make no sense. And what that product is going to do in the longevity of its lifetime or have any impact on actual, you know, sort of meaningful things that IoT can achieve, such as, you know, healthcare, for example. Uh, how it can help people. Um, so structure is very important to look at because nature builds things in a very intelligent way. We always use it as an inspiration. Uh, if you look at the things that are created, also are brought about from technology. Uh, this building, for example, in Dubai, which opens and closes uh, as the sun moves around it, it was a great inspiration for us as well uh, in what we created with our robot. So I think biomimicry should be looked at as an inspiration for many things, but not as a literal translation. <clears throat> have, how many of you guys, maybe some of you have this in your home, I have no idea, <laughs> I hope not. Uh, does anyone have these chairs in their house? Okay. Uh, as an industrial design instructor at Art Center in Pasadena, I was, I've used this as an example to my students before. Um, you know, it's fun, it's whimsical, uh, but why? Why are we creating objects like this? Um, creating something for the sake of creating it just because it's ridiculous and it's funny and it's cute uh, is fine. Uh, but now what we see through the advent of technology and easier fabrication methodologies is that the average 25-year-old graduating from an engineering school through 3D printing and a few softwares can start producing a product and get it out to market faster than we can say market. And that's one of the issues that we're, we're facing right now. <clears throat> These are literal translations. <clears throat> Our product is called the sunflower. And the sunflower that you see below, uh, I think, is just a really failed attempt at trying to put sensors and trying to recreate nature in a, in a more whimsical, ridiculous way. Um, I think we should learn from the motion of the kangaroo instead of actually mimicking its body shape. It's very important. <clears throat> Like the spoon below, it might be interesting for a child, but only for maybe a couple of years. I'm not sure if you guys use any of those. I mean, are you guys seeing products like this emerge uh, more and more today or not? I'm curious to, to know your thoughts. I know that you guys are dealing on the data side and IoT in general and just the connectivity of everything and anything. But part of the issue is that these products, which are so from the perspective of, of a startup that is creating these products, I'm interested to know if you guys see the implication of what's happening from the design standpoint. Does anyone have any comments on that? that yeah, I, I think it's important uh, because the reason why I felt it was important, and I talked to my CEO about uh, wanting to present here today, because it was less for us than for just where IoT is going. And I think that between all of the intelligent people that are here in the last couple of days, you are in a position as consultants, as advisors to startups. Uh, you're in a position where you're actually dealing with this information going into little objects. And you're, you know, you have, you're right there in a room with, a, with an engineer that graduated a couple of years ago that says, I have the greatest idea. I'm going to create a carrot spoon that reminds you to eat carrots. And then it's going to connect to your phone, and that data is going to eventually end up somewhere in SAP or, or IBM. But is that important? So that's where you guys have to kind of play a role in changing that, because uh, we have to separate what's important in IoT and 
figure out a way to sort of slow down the process of all the frivolous product that's being created, ideally. <clears throat> I mean, uh, again, no offense to people that, you know, in the room that might have any one of these products in their home. Um, but I mean, I really don't need to be, you know, reminded. I certainly don't need the comb, uh, you guys can imagine. Uh, but I mean, to brush your hair, for the comb to realize if it was frizzy today or not, that data is ending up somewhere. I mean, I, I'm not really sure, you know, what we're creating that for. Of course, we can't stop it. So the idea is educating the entrepreneurs and the startups to actually start thinking a little bit more. Biomimicry is one of those ways. Because nature does not create objects like that. Not necessarily the objects, but the path in which that object was created was just based on just creating another commodity. And it's not going to last very long, because people are making fun of these objects all, all around the internet. Now I'm really scared to show our robot, too, at the end of the. Um, so this is me looking at IoT. Uh, this is how I feel. Um, completely confused um, sometimes, and wondering you know, what is connected to what. Uh, one of the reasons why we decided as a startup to tackle uh, the environment, the outdoor weather, uh, was because it was a necessity. People needed to take a computer outdoors. It needed to live outdoors. How are we going to do this? How are we going to take the, the connectivity that people need inside their home, outside? And that's what I believe we achieved. Um, and we wanted to leave part of the soap opera away. And that's why I have this video. It's something we use in the robotics lab. Is the teddy bear turned on by the coffee maker? Or at this point, this is something we always talk about. We don't know, or if it may be someday. Um, that's how some of the data is. There's a lot of, you know, unused and literally ridiculous data that's out there, um, and it's quite confusing for the consumer. I think for us, as a as a company that is producing product for the consumer and also for the B two B market, these are questions that they're asking us all the time. So, will it connect to the teddy bear? And does the you know what happens with the Philips lights and we're definitely not experts in that, but we need to call experts and to explain to the consumer what in the world is going on inside. This is another example. Um, so sometimes we feel that the conversations of IoT, uh, I was listening to <clears throat> uh, another general session, it seems like it's always around sort of, okay, so then we can do this, and then that will do that, and that will do that, and I think that it's always within the sandbox. I think we need to step outside of the sandbox, look at it from the outside, like the way visionaries used to look at you know, creating a railroad in the 18th century when there was basically just horse and wagons. That railroad is like the IoT. It's connecting things to each other. But that vision to create that kind of you know, advance and to help mankind is the things that I think IoT should be doing, which it is. Um, and you guys know that. Uh, it's about how do we actually step outside of that and say, where is it going to go? We're in a machine age. We're going to be coexisting with machines. I'm certainly asking those questions. I'm asking those questions for my kids uh, who are actually wondering what it's going to be like uh, to have robotic surgeons, which can diagnose you know, on a molecular level the issues that a patient has better than any doctor ever has in history. Um, so the world's changing, and we're recreating these interconnected things today. But in the context of us as humans trying to interact with them, and then that's going to change someday. So I think it's interesting to look at maybe a larger picture. Where is all of this going? So I want to play this video, because I think of all the, we force children to play in sandboxes. And I think it's a habitual thing. And the reason why I want to play this video, because I loved it, I uh, watched it on YouTube. And this kid's a visionary, and he's trying to tell something to uh, his mom, and his mom keeps on pushing him. So he leaves the sandbox after a completely different solution. He's fascinated by the world around him. And she's going to keep on asking him to go back. Is he going to put that back in the sandbox? We often quote people like Jobs. We don't do any dirt. Yuck, 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 yuck. But these are the jobs of the world. Yuck, yuck. 
So we need to think, I mean, the speaker prior to this uh, session said we need to think different. And I was trying to listen to what he was saying that was very different. But we really do need to think differently. He's trying to say there's something interesting here, you're not hearing me. And it's not in the sandbox. That's right, that's dirt. Yeah. Can you say dirt? Dirt. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I think our responsibility, uh, I think I have certain responsibilities. I certainly am not an expert in IoT. I think the community here today in the last couple of days, also in my opinion, has a responsibility to look at these things and question and try to see if there's any possible way to communicate uh, to all the visionaries out there, startups or whoever it may be, or entrepreneurs that have another idea that you guys are helping to say, yeah, absolutely, no, we can connect this and then we can connect that and then that will be connected to something else. And eventually that data is going to be somewhere and the only one that's going to ever understand how to disseminate that data is a super uh, AI machine. Because that data, I mean, how people, I mean, the data, you, you guys all know that the data from combing the hair as it's being stored will be stored somewhere. And it's just creating more data. You guys remember where we started. Like, the, the other thing is that we are literally living in a golden age. Okay, so we're living in a golden age not with only technology, but what technology is do, doing to design. And I think today is the first time that I've experienced in the last, let's say, two, two three, four years that architects and industrial designers are now looking at the products and saying, wait, wait, we're starting to see this stuff. We didn't care about robots because robotics had a certain aesthetic. It was sort of the survivalist aesthetic or the you know, uh, transformer aesthetic. Now we're trying to take those things and make them a little bit more amicable for people to live with. And they don't need to be anthropomorphic anymore. So the bug-eyed robots that are walking around or your vacuum with sort of uh, hair on it or whatever it may be, and I'm sure they'll create some, something like that. Um, those are unnecessary. So I think it's a golden age of designers now really looking at how do we create product that seamlessly integrates and helps humans with this interface and interaction, at least for as long as we can hold the fort. <clears throat> So these are the robots of today, and I still think that there's, there's a long way for them to go. Um, and that's, that's a little bit of my expertise where I can talk a little bit about industrial design. And I think that, for example, uh, it's a little freaky looking at, a, at an object that, that has eyes on it uh, that doesn't necessarily need to have eyes on it. Um, so we're going to live with, with robots on a daily basis uh, in the next few years, and, and our children, for sure, will be living uh, with machines. So I think it's important to look at what people are creating and have some sort of an impact on it. So this is a little message for entrepreneurs and, and people who are interested in creating the next um, idea. And I think some of you are mostly in data. I'm not sure. I'm sure it crosses over to products. And even in the medical field, a particular product is created. What does that product end up looking like? So I think these are, these are questions you need to ask. So, you know, question what you're about to create. That's really important. And uh, that's something that we do. And uh, although we had the opportunity to create a multitude of different products to help people outdoors, we focused many of them into one product to reduce the amount of noise and extra pieces we needed to make. That was a very difficult task. It's taken us over three years of R&D just on, on trying to basically put a computer outdoors. Uh, biomimicry, again, is an example that nature does things in a, in a way that makes sense. And that's, that's what this is for. And understanding the context, and everyone here that is trying to push for connectivity on the medical side, et cetera, and I, I'm all for that. But then when you're working with people, uh, do any of you guys consult um, startups? Or uh, I'm sure you do, but OK. And is that what, what you normally do, is consult startups on IoT? And do you, do you come across, uh, you know, I'm sure you come across ideas, because startups, there's, there's, we're honored to be considered the startup of, of uh, the month last month, but there's like thousands of them. And, and I, I don't blame VCs today, because it's just a jungle of people coming up with an idea that, that have the capability through technology, uh, you know, segued into IoT, um, to make things that are connected. So what, what, what is your message to, to people?
Yes. Correct. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, in some ways, uh, you know, I'm happy. Uh, I'm not happy that I'm not 22, <laughs> but uh, I'm happy that it's not my first company, even though it's, it's uh, my passion for the next 10, 15 years. But I do come with that background and knowledge of fabrication, which, which definitely changes the way. And, and I'm getting to my next uh, point, and I think this is the, the key of where we're going. Um, let me see. So... I'm calling this era, uh, other designers as well, uh, in sort of the design, industrial design community, at least in art center in certain circles, we're calling it intelligence design. Because for the first time, we have the capability of sending information out that could be 3D printed and then merge with another component built in Romania while another team in South America is working on another facet of that same piece. And we've never had this ability before, nor have we had the ability to take such nano uh, technology and embedded into things. We used to be able to dream about making a beetle's wing. Uh, today, we can do that through micro servos, and I think it's just a magical golden age. But it, it is where intelligence design is not. Five more minutes? Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about encasing technology in, in a product and then try to find out how to actually make the PCB board fit in the product. It's looking at outside in, inside out, and, and it's a little bit more. So I think industrial design is going to change. So is architecture. Uh, I think you guys can imagine that we're getting ready to get into the next phase of kinetic buildings. I certainly have been waiting for that. Uh, bus stops that can shift and change to the, to the sun. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting things that we're going to start seeing um, as technology starts going in there. But I think that a new type of education has to start taking place in schools as well. So it's not just engineering in its bubble, sort of electrical engineering in its bubble, mechanical, then you have the you know, industrial design. It's a convergence of all of these under a field called intelligence design. So. <clears throat> go there quickly. Um, this is how we, I see it. So um, robotics obviously has been exploding. Technology is growing faster than we can imagine. And now all of a sudden we're starting to see you know, great products being designed, more intelligent products finally being designed. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting time. These are some examples. Um, look at how beautiful the, the Nest uh, uh, product is. I mean, just the, the, the way the circles are, are created, it, that's bio, biomimicry. Uh, a speaker that uses not only the shape of biomimicry and the golden mean, but it also helps the sound. Um, and I think that really design is changing now. And, and uh, if we can separate the frivolous objects from great design, uh, something wonderful is happening right now. Bio, you know, nanorobots. Um, I think it's, it's an incredible field. Uh, it's a little scary, too, to see one of these flying around. I'm, in fact, how many of you guys have thought about the fact that the blue sky that we're looking at is going to be you know, just full of drones. Do you guys know what that's going to look like? I certainly don't. I, I'm, I mean, my kids are definitely going to wake up and see that. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to sort of live with that. Um, I'll try to skip through these videos quickly. Um, Japanese just recently discovered, finally, how the wing is folded. 
Uh, so technology is what allowed us to do that. And now this is going to translate into robotics, which I think is fantastic. Um, and the products that are being created today are, are you going to cut the sound at one point if I reach the five minute, or are you just going to keep it going? Okay. <laughs> Still literal at its initial state, but it'll get there from a design standpoint. You guys get the idea. Sorry, I'm trying to rush through these. I talked too much. I mean, it'd be interesting to have like a zillion of these uh, wage war against, uh, you know, sort of pests in farms. That would be an interesting idea. That's sci-fi. Yeah. Um, this is the product we've created. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It was launched at CES. It's called the Sunflower. Um, obviously, it's a computer that lives outdoors. We try to solve a problem. First and foremost, it is based in biomimicry. It protects itself. Uh, it has multiple sensors. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a computer in the form of a parasol. This is our first product. We have a whole series of very unusual products that we will release in the next several years. Um, but it definitely detects the wind. So people who are paraplegics, who are disabled, do not need to close it. There's a lot of advantages. It, it's GSM enabled, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Uh, obviously, it has machine learning security cameras on board that can track uh, basically intruders in your house. But you can take this to the farm, the beach. Uh, so what it, what it in essence did was bring IoT outdoors in, in what we believed was the only viable object. Uh, instead of speaking to your barbecue or speaking to your chair uh, in your backyard, we believed that the parasol was the most logical solution. And, and trying to cram all that technology into something very small and make it uh, uh, an object that could withstand weather um, was, a, was a big challenge. It will be available next year. So instead of making it look like a sunflower, it basically behaves like one. It tracks the sun using algorithms. And we hope that uh, we can educate the consumer to realize that it's not just a parasol that you throw on the ground, that it's actually a computer you're putting outside your home. Did I hit it right on time? Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it.